guy that sells the brooms must be completely out, right? Right? <laughs> Every time I look out there, I see a sea of brooms, and this is the first group I don't see a broom. He must be completely out of here. <laughs> I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dale. Thank you for coming and joining us here at the uh, OKC Home and Garden Show. Thank you folks for joining us. His presentation is fantastic. Take it away. Hello. It works. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Del Spinmore, and my wife and I are the creators of the Seed the Spoon mobile app. Um, I'll talk more about it in a little bit, but really I want to talk about our garden and what led us to create the app. So I'm going to start off by, uh, so this, this is our garden here. This was when we started our backyard uh, garden two years ago, I guess three years ago now, this is what it looked like. And over the course of two years, uh, I guess you could, you could say I became a little bit obsessed and, and this happened. So through the process of doing all of this, this is kind of what led to us building the app. And what I want to talk about today are the, the, the mistakes that we made in the beginning and kind of the lessons that we learned all along the way and basically everything that we've learned about growing food. I want to kind of get it all out as best I can over the next hour. So if you have any questions about anything that we're going through, feel free to raise your hand. I can dive into details on whatever you'd like. Um, this, is, this is our talk together. So whatever you all want to hear about, just, just let me know. So my story started back in 2008, at least this, yeah. So um, this is my older daughter, Brooklyn. She's 10 now, and this is when she was born. I, I was 340 pounds, and I was a much different person back then. I, uh, pretty much all of my, my meals were fast food, uh, sometimes multiple fast food places at once. Um, I had my gallbladder taken out at 23. I, I had a lot of health problems, I had a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression. I didn't necessarily know it back then, though. So when my daughter was born, I, I had this, pretty much the moment I saw her, I had this realization that if I wanted to be the kind of dad that I wanted to be, I needed to change. I needed to lose weight, I needed to get healthier, I needed to change things. So back then, this was 2008, 2009-ish, I got really into marathon running and cycling and all that kind of thing. And I was able to lose about 120 pounds in about nine months. But I did it the wrong way, now looking back on it. I did it the, the subway diet, just kind of counting calories, not really paying attention to the contents of the food. And even though I, I was down to my lowest weight ever, I, was, I, I went on the Rachel Ray show for weight loss, I had all this stuff going on, and, but I was still, I still had anxiety, I still had depression, I still, still wasn't happy. You know, I, no matter how much I ran, no matter what I did, there was always just another marathon I wanted to run faster. It was just never, it never got me what I was looking for. So this eventually led me down a bit of a dark path and my ego took control of me and I was spending all of my time trying to run marathons and ride my bike and just trying to find something. And luckily, I found her. And in 2008, in 2013, we met and um, almost instantly my life changed. And she's, Carrie, where are you? I think she ran off, you know. She's the most loving person I've ever known. And, and when you're with someone like that, it just makes you kind of think about how you treat people and how you live life. And, and basically, long story short, three months into our relationship, that kind of dark side of myself that I try and hide came out. That anxiety, that depression came out. And I, I kind of blew up on her one day. And, and, and she was the first person in my life that didn't let me kind of blow it off. You know, she was the first person that said, hold on here. Like, this is not you. This is what's going on. And, and that basically led me to this book called The Depression Cure that talks about how you can overcome anxiety and depression and things like that without taking medication, just through natural methods. So I read this book, it all made a lot of sense to me. I've actually got a link to the book right here if you wanna know more about it, it's cdspoon.net slash depression book. But basically the book just said that if I drank a bunch of water and I ate the right foods and I got enough exercise and I slept like I was supposed to and mindfulness is a huge thing that's basically just focusing on right now in the moment and not worrying about the past or the future and I got enough sunlight and social activity. If I committed myself to these things, then it would make things better. So it made sense to me, and I dove in. And almost immediately, we realized this is gonna be expensive because the food part costs a lot of money. So we thought, well, I, I hear this stuff grows out of the ground if we just throw some seeds, so let's try that out. So that is when our gardening journey began. So this is kind of the start of, of the Garden War story. This is 2015, a new growth. So we started off with the square foot gardening book and my daughters and I got to work and basically it just 
So this is the square foot gardening book here, and, and this is basically how it works. If you take a box, you fill it with a mix of potting soil, and you divide that box into squares. And then in each square, you can plant whatever you want, and then there's the guidelines for how far apart the seeds go and what goes well next to each other, and, and all of this stuff in this book. And I like it. I like this a lot because I've worked in software development my whole career. I have very much an engineering background. That's how my mind likes to process information. So I really liked this. And, and we dove in, we started growing pretty much one or two of every food. And um, the first time I tasted spinach out of the garden, that, that was kind of a moment for me. Because up until then, I knew spinach as something that came out of a can and a Popeye light and that I thought was gross. And that's all I really knew about spinach. Um, but when I had it out of the garden, I actually liked it. Like the, the taste of it fresh, just raw spinach was incredible. And, and it was just kind of this light bulb moment where it was, you know, with this added nutrition, or with this added taste comes added nutrition and everything else as well. And that was kind of the ball that got things rolling to where then I was, I was lost after that moment. So, um, you know, this was the end of our first year. This is what our yard looked like. We had two, I think three raised beds here. I was watching a lot of YouTube videos, reading a lot of books, just taking a master gardener course, doing everything I could to learn like I said, I'm a little autistic and a lot OCD, and I was full throttle obsessed with this at this point. So uh, another thing that the book talked about was the importance of compost. And if you don't know what compost is, it's basically just um, stuff that used to be alive that has been sitting around for a while. So the earth turns it into stuff that become plant food. That's how everything works. And um, making your own compost can save you a lot of money. So this is one of our first compost bins, compost bins that we built that we just use zip ties and. Uh, these are just uh, shipping pallets that we zip tied together, and we just started making compost. And um, you can actually get compost and compost in bulk from a number of places around here. Uh, Minic Materials and Markham's Nursery both have really good compost sources. But we just, um, yeah, we started. This is our first compost bin here. We started making our own, and and we were having a lot of fun at the end of the first year. But we were also making a lot of mistakes because. I, you know, I, I digested all this information from this book, but I didn't have the practical knowledge yet of understanding what some of the stuff meant. So the book said, make sure you use companion planting and you interplant peas and carrots, right? Well, I thought, okay, well, I'll just do a checkered pattern. Well, I didn't know that peas are gonna grow to four feet tall and that you've got to trellis them. So I had to build individual TPs for each square. It was a mess the first year. So one of the big things that we took away from the first year was trying to overcome some of the mistakes we made and trying to innovate some of the stuff that wasn't fun. Because not everything in Gardner likes doing. I really like watering in March and April when I'm tired of being indoors. Come July, I don't want to water anymore. So, uh, so we started thinking about ways to innovate some of that, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit. And this is what leads us into the second part, our second year. 2016, the Bermuda strikes back. And if you've never dealt with Bermuda grass, it is a nightmare. That's one of the key takeaways we took from that first year was that I was spending all of my time uh, mowing around the beds and weeding the beds and doing all this and not actually gardening. I was mowing all the time and I was, I was frustrated with it and I had enough and the black landscaping fabric stuff that you use, the weed block is, does not work on Bermuda grass at all and it just creates a nightmare. So, so I turned to cardboard. Oh, all right, sorry. This is my, so my daughter Mary was born at this time too, which is an important thing to note because Within like five minutes of eating, she made it known that we had to build a lot more gardens of being born because she ate like immediately. And so we got to work and we started building more garden beds and we started trying to solve this Bermuda grass problem. So we turned to cardboard and we basically started covering our entire backyard with cardboard and then covering that with a foot of wood chips. Now I know what you're thinking, wood chips are like, you know, $3 a bag at Lowe's or how did you afford that? Don't buy wood chips. I'm here to tell you, please do not buy wood chips. There's no reason to. You can get truckloads of wood chips from the city of Norman. I think Midwest City may have one as well, but definitely Norman. They have a compost facility where landscaping companies from around the city bring in their trees. They run them through a chipper. They even do it twice so they look nice for you. And they have a pile of the nice stuff because they want to get rid of all this stuff. You come in, they have a tractor, they load it in the back of your truck, you take it home. You can get as much as you want for free. So this was my gym membership. Every, every two or three days, I went and got a truckload, brought it back home. I'm sure my neighbors think I'm insane. They're probably saying, no, I didn't do with this stuff. But, so I just started covering the backyard. You can see we kind of started branching out, and we laid down cardboard and cardboard. And I talked my wife into letting me build all the way along the fence at this point. 
Um, I didn't, I couldn't really have her buy on going that way yet, but you'll see how I overcame that here in a minute. One thing I do want to mention is these raised beds on legs here. I thought I was being really smart when I built these because this fence here is on the south side, and you can see the shade here from from you know probably six months out of the year. This is shaded, so I can't grow on the ground here, which causes the problems for trying to grow in the winter. So I thought, well, I'll just build these on raised legs and get them up off the, off the ground. The problem is, is that in the winter they get very cold, and in the summer they get very hot. So they're temperamental. They still have uses, and I'll talk about that and show that here in a little bit. But that's that's one of the things we tried to change there. So you can see we kind of kept going, kept piling on wood chips. And then I did this one day. And I had a really bad day, I don't remember what it was, but I had to go outside and lay cardboard. And I kind of just did all this and I came inside and I said, hey, hey Gary, you might want to come look at this. <laughs> and she came outside and she was like, that actually doesn't look bad. And then from then on, I was like, okay, I got the whole yard now, I'm good to go. She came and see that side of the yard, so I'm, I'm good. So, um, this is kind of where we start, and this and this, there's other reasons behind the wood chips too. So right now we have you know mostly raised beds scattered around. But what we're starting to do now is in these areas where the cardboard and the wood chips have been deteriorating for a couple of years now, that soil is really good. There's this whole gardening method called back to Eden, which I really encourage you to look into if, if you would like to know more. But basically the idea is is you try and recreate the the the, the surface floor of the forest, which is mostly stuff like this that breaks down, worms come up and eat it, and you've got this really good, really good uh, ecosystem. So we're working on now planting in trees and shrubs and perennial sources around our raised beds, so kind of, kind of having a mix of stuff. So we kept building along the way, and then you can see the raised beds here, we built along the fence, and then this happened. So this is my grandpa, and he's always he was always one of the most influential people in my life. He was one of the people that kind of formed who I am, and whenever he passed, um, I, I, a year before, I had buried a good friend, not physically buried, I went to his funeral, and the person that did his funeral didn't know, um, didn't even know how to say his name, and it, and it left me coming away from that thinking, no one I love is ever going down without someone that knew them talking about them, and no one else wanted to do it, so it was my, it was, it was my thing, and, and so I had a week where I knew I was going to be talking about his funeral, and that's a pretty stressful thing, um, so I spent the whole week outside uh, letting him talk to me, and I built these four garden beds here um, that week. And this is when I first started to feel the therapeutic effects of gardening. I mean, I felt kind of the physical side of it, but this was, this was kind of the mental side of it for me. Whenever, you know, whenever I just, um, I needed to get away, I would come out here. And this, is, and this started to bleed into other areas of my life too. So I'm, I'm a software developer and, and I work from home primarily. And I have a tendency to where if I can't figure something out, I will not get away from the computer. I will stay on it and I will force myself to work at it for hours on end. And that can lead to a lot of problems. So the human brain is not designed to work that way. And in fact, um, it works better if you give it a rest in time. So now when I'm working from home, if I have a problem, um, I go out in the garden, I spend some time, you know, an hour or so, then I come back and it frees up my mind to come up with these solutions. So this is really when I first started feeling the therapeutic effects, and this is when I knew that we were really on to something. And we, and, and we had overcome some of the mistakes that we made, and we were starting to have success. So we were getting a lot of food out of the garden, more than we could handle, um, so much so that we were getting bored with some of the food. We were trying to come up with new ways to cook it. Carrie found 27 ways to make zucchini. We have them all on our website. <laughs> she had like two weeks of vlogging about zucchini. But we, you know, we were having a lot of fun and we were starting to innovate because we had all this extra garden space and it was a pain to water and um, I wasn't doing a good job of watering it because I was, I mean, my attention gets on other things. So I, I built these irrigation grids and basically what these are are PVC pipe with holes drilled every three or four inches along the way. And then you can hook up, here's a picture as I was showing us building it here, but you can hook up a hose connector here. This piece is like 250 at Home Depot hooks up to a standard garden hose and you connect to BBC. So now I was able to water beds without me having to water. And to take this up a step further, I added in a orbit timer, so an automatic water timer with four outlets, so I can have four hoses hooked up. So now I have four beds that we fully automate. So obviously I have more than four beds, but I can rotate them around and I can kind of have the schedule. So the one downside to this irrigation system is that you can only water about 32 square feet at a time. Trust me, I've tried 34 and 36, it doesn't work. And 32 is the number you can do at a time before you start losing water pressure. And 
some of the other drip irrigation, like the you know the, the black drip tubing with the emitters, and those you can get away with watering a lot more at once. So I recommend those, but this is a really great system for when you're first getting started, and maybe you only have a couple beds, this is a really great system. But if you get to the point where you're gonna have a bunch like we have, think about moving over to that other type of irrigation system because you'll be able to water a lot more at a time, be a lot less of a hassle. So this is another thing we came up with. Um, the Square Foot Gardening book talks a lot about the importance of water temperature when watering. And basically the idea is, you know, on those days when it's, you know, 80 degrees outside, um, if you're watering from a hose, the water's going to be a lot colder. And that's going to shock the plants a little bit, and they're not going to, they're not going to respond to the water as well as they would have, as if it would just, you know, been rainfall or some you know, water that would have naturally gotten to that plant. So we built these rainwater collection systems, and basically what these are are just two IVC totes. I get these on Craigslist for like 60 to 75 bucks. You just kind of look around. There's always people that are selling them because people that work at uh, all sorts of places. These came from, place, from a place that cleaned some sort of tanks. So these stored vinegar in them before. So I know they're completely safe for what I'm doing. I still wash them out really well. But you can cover them in this black plastic to keep algae from growing. And then this system here kind of filters out the debris from the roof. And I've actually got a video on my website that talks all about the system and all about how it works. So you can go in there and read, read more about it. But um, this is one of the things that we started building. And right now, this is kind of an independent thing. It's not hooked up to the watering grids. I was really close to hooking up like an RV water pump to power it all and everything. But uh, yeah, so um, another thing we did was we started building beds on the east side of everything that we own. And the reason for that is because in Oklahoma, you, full sun is very intense, especially in summer. And there are a lot of things that are not going to do well in full sun. So spinach, kale, and lettuce were three of our favorite things we like to grow, but those only really grow well whenever the temperature is below 75. Once it gets about a bat, they're going to start bolting and going to seed you're not going to have anymore. Well, on the east side of this bed, it's about 30 degrees cooler than it is everywhere else in my backyard. So you can utilize you know, different, different areas of your yard to grow the thing that you're trying to grow. You need to think about your yard as a series of microclimates that you can plant things in that do best in that spot. So another thing we wanted to do was rebuild our compost bins. And I want to show this because I want to show how you can do a lot of things without having to spend a lot of money. So this is just pallets we got for free. Again, our scavenged Craigslist, you know, look behind buildings, whatever. They're really easy to find. Uh, I do want to mention it's important to look for a stamp on the pallet that has HT, what that means is heat treated. If it doesn't have that stamp, there's a chance it was treated with some sort of chemical. And I don't like playing with any of that stuff. It's one of the reasons why I grow all this stuff. So um, you can also find cedar pallets, and obviously those are great. But that's one thing I want to mention about these pallets. But here's what we're able to do with them. My uncle Noel and I spent a day where we went through and cut them all down, and then we built this out of it. So this is a compost bin where I'm able to lift these front gates so I can eliminate it if needed, which is really handy when you're moving things from one pile to the next, because when I had a fixed lid here, I was doing like one of these things, you know, and, and it hurt my back all the time. So, um, but I just want to show this because you don't have to, you don't have to go buy a bunch of stuff to build gardens. I could have built gardens out of this too. In fact, I have gardens that are built out of things like this. You can use a lot of repurposed stuff if you're trying to save money and cut costs. Another thing we wanted to do was we wanted to have food over the winter. Um, the first year, we didn't really have much food past October, November-ish. We definitely didn't have anything through December and January. But kale and spinach, beets, carrots, a lot of other things like that will grow here in Oklahoma all throughout the winter if they have the right conditions. So one thing you can do is build these little greenhouse covers. And this is really simple. I've got guides on my website that detail it, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But basically, it's just a 2 by 4 frame at the bottom and then PVC that attaches into it, and then you just got this polyfill. Everything on here can be bought at a big box store or Ace Hardware, any place like that. And what these do, now on these beds, because the, it gets so cold below, it didn't work as well. It's really my raised beds that are on the ground that this works on, but this allows you to basically adjust your zone one full zone south. So right here in Oklahoma, we're zone seven. We're, with this, you can go down to zone eight. And basically what that means is you have no problem growing kale, spinach, and lettuce all winter. And you even got a pretty good chance of growing any type of root crop and maybe even some other stuff too. So, and another thing you can do is you can switch out, instead of using plastic here, you can use insect netting, which is a great way to grow things like broccoli and cabbage and 
kale that normally get attacked by insects pretty hard without having to use any pesticide. You just cover the whole thing with insect netting. And these are pretty cool because, so this is just a door hinge on this side here, so I can just lift it and harvest. The first time we made these, I had these kind of, I had the plastic attached with clips and stuff, and it was a pain. That's why I like making these to make it easier to, to lift up and harvest. And nothing I want to mention too, this was not my idea. I got this from the One Yard Revolution YouTube channel, which I highly recommend. He has like 600 videos over the past four or five years. And um, now if, you're, if you have the addictive personality like I do, and you're gonna watch all of them in one weekend, warn your spouse, because he has the same intro music in every video, and they will go crazy. I can verify. There was a weekend I was sick, and I watched like literally all day, nothing but his videos and she had had enough of that music. And he really likes his cat, and she... <laughs> but anyway, there's a lot of really good sources out there besides just that on YouTube. There's a lot of really good books, and I've got a lot of that stuff linked on my website, too. This is more just kind of showing pictures of the covering there. And this is with the insect editing, so you can see what that looks like. So another thing, the first year we bought... So most of our plants, we can start from seed. That's kind of the thing that most people don't realize is most things you can start directly from seed outside. You don't have to buy transplants or anything like that. But there are some things that you have to do that with. Tomatoes and peppers in particular have a very long growing season. And if you want to be able to have any before August, you need to start them indoors in January or so so you can have them you know, in May and June. Same with cabbage and broccoli. There's a few things you need to start indoors. And um, I wanted to start trying to grow them, but I did want to buy like, some expensive grow light set up and all that. And I was really intimidated by the idea of grow lights because it seemed like there was a lot of stuff I was going to learn. And we built this, and I'm really excited to show you this because I think it illuminates, well, so one thing I want to talk about is the, the, the lights in particular. When I, when I first started looking into this, I heard so much about how you have to have this color temperature, and this color temperature, and all this stuff, and you can ignore all of that. If you're only starting seeds, it doesn't matter. You can just use regular daylight bulbs, whatever it is that come, it doesn't matter. Because the different color of wavelengths of light really only apply if you're trying to grow something all the way to produce fruit and all the way to full-size plant. I'm not doing any of that indoors. I mean, I have no reason to. So all I'm doing is starting seeds, and this is all they need. They just need to be under grow lights, and you just raise these in about an inch or two above the plant. And this was built just from, again, Craigslist and Facebook, you know, Marketplace and things like that. This is actually, a, I think my Uncle Noel had this sitting around this part. These lights, we all just, you know, we just kind of found them on, you can get them, you can get them at like Lowe's or Home Depot, like 15 bucks, they're not super expensive. Um, and then these, we just get at nurseries around. And I think a lot of these we just had from stuff we'd already bought, and I just kind of saved the, saved the stuff for it. But this is a way you can save a lot of money too, is by starting your own seeds. And we have a guide on how we build all this too, on our website there. Um, one other thing I'll talk about. So, um, the first year that we grew, I really bought in hard to the square foot gardening principles. And I still subscribe to probably 80 to 90% of it. But the fact is, that book was written by a guy that's a northerner, and he's not from Oklahoma, and, and it's not written for Oklahoma. So when he talks about things like you know tomatoes, you need to, to prune down to just one stem, right? That probably works great up north. But here, it creates conditions to fry a tomato plant in the summer, because it doesn't have the other leaves around it to protect it. So, you know, in the beginning I was doing the whole square foot gardening single stem method, and now I've kind of gotten away from that. So, um, for our tomatoes, we do round cages. I don't think I have a picture of that in here. But then for all of our other trellising things, I basically just build these on the north sides of the bed. And these are just T-posts and cattle panels that I get at Tractor Supply for about 14 bucks. And I zip tie them to that. And then they're on the north side of each bed. And this is where I grow my peas, my beans, cucumbers, anything like that. And then everything in the, in the bed here, you know, isn't shaded obviously because they're on the north side. Now I know what you're thinking, back here is shaded. And yeah, I, I did that on purpose because I want to have another shade area. So this is another spot where I can have lettuce and spinach and stuff like that. And right now it gets full sun. Now come April or so, maybe even towards the end of this month, it won't. But by then it needs some shade. So that's how you need to think about your yard is setting up microclimates so that you can grow different things throughout the year without having to have raised beds scattered all around the yard. You can have different microclimates within one raised bed. We also added a rabbit. So rabbits are one of the best things you can have for your garden because their fertilizer, can, their manure, can be used immediately in the garden as fertilizer. With horses and cows and goats and chickens, you need to wait a little bit and let it compost before you can use it. But with rabbits, you can use it immediately. So we've got Roger here, and the thing is, we had a different, rad, a different rabbit before, and it was a regular sized rabbit, 
but I thought if we're going to have a rabbit for the purpose of producing compost, I want this to be the most efficient process possible, right? So naturally, I joined a rabbit breeding group on Facebook and I started researching, and I found there's this Flemish giant, which can get to 20 pounds. So I thought that's our rabbit. So I contacted the rabbit dealer. She had one with a bum ear. It wasn't going to be a show rabbit. And I said, that's our guy. So we got Roger. And now we're going to be getting Jessica soon. I think we're going to become rabbit breeders. I think that's happening. I don't think we have a choice once we get Jessica. I think it's happening. So, <laughs> so that leads us into the kind of the third part of the story, which is 2017 return of the keyboard. So I, I mentioned earlier that I've been in software development kind of my whole career. And all throughout building the garden and, and all throughout doing all this stuff, I kept thinking, I'm tired of carrying around all these books. There needs to be an app that makes this easier. And I tried every single one of them. And none of them really did everything I was looking for. Some of them have really good information about companion plants, but not really anything about pets. Or they had something about companions, but not about how to plant. So anyway, Carrie and I started working on solving this problem last year. And in January, we released the first version of our mobile app that solves this problem. The first one, I want to go back just a little bit. I'm sorry I got ahead of schedule, and I'm going to talk about something different. So in 2017, this was kind of, so at the end of 2016, we had, um, we had the election, obviously. Don't worry, I'm not getting political. I, saw, I, like, I always say that, and people like, look at me like, I'm not doing that at all. But I will say, I, I was waiting in line to vote, and I'm going to show this picture, and it'll make sense in a second. But I was waiting in line to vote at a church nearby my house, and I was so frustrated and just sad. And I was going to feel that way no matter who won. Obviously, I was about all of them. And I was just, I had four kids, and I was thinking about, you know, the world they're growing up in and the world they're going to grow up in. And, and anyway, my daughter, Mary, she's two or one or two at the time. She was playing, and she's very outgoing, way more than I am, way more social than I am. And she had made some friends. And one of the friends that she made while waiting in line was the one of the directors of the Oklahoma Baptist Homes for Children, which their campus is right outside my backyard. And I look over there, and every Tuesday they mow this giant field back here. And I get, and I think, why are you doing that? We could be growing food out there. We could be doing all this stuff. And I had all kind of this idea in the back of my head all this time. And and you know, a minute after feeling so sad and waiting in line, I get I get introduced to this person. And five minutes later, I, I'm I'm invited to come help them with the garden. And then the next person I meet is. An elderly couple that wants to grow food has no idea where to start, right? They, right where I was a couple years ago. And I felt like in that moment, God told me, if you're so worried about what's going on in the world, why aren't you fixing it? And I was like, what, what do I do? And, and I felt like I was told. You know, I, you just, I spent the first 30 years of my life learning everything about how computers work, and the next three learning about how vegetables work. And I feel like I could combine those two to do something useful with this time. Because I have, I have a lot of energy that keeps me up at night. A lot of times where I try to go to sleep and my brain just won't let me. And in the past, I let that energy control me a little bit. So I would go read the news, dive into what's going on, think about what happens if North Korea nuclear, there's all those things, right? I like would go all down those rabbit holes. And now I take all of that time and dump it directly into either writing about gardening, shooting videos about gardening, or working on our app. So that was kind of where we were the day of the election, what led us to start this whole kind of from seed to spoon thing. And the reason why I'm showing this picture is because this is the community garden for the Baptist Children's Home that we were able to build just a few months after meeting him. And now I'm working on trying to get that whole field converted into pumpkins. I'm working on them. I've got some partners on it. I think we're going to be able to do it. And that's the goal, is to have this whole field growing pumpkins that we can sell at the end of the year, and then all the money goes back to the children's home, and we can do something really cool with that area they're just mowing right now. So that was kind of what led to this whole seed to spoon thing. And, and up until this point, I've been posting a lot on Facebook, you know, to my friends about, you know, my garden. And it's basically <laughs> all I did on Facebook was, was that kind of stuff. And I was having a lot of people come to me and ask me, how did you do this? What did you, you know, what did you do on this type of thing? And, and again, I like efficiency and I don't like typing things over and over. So I thought, well, I'll just make a blog for it and I'll make a website. And, and that's basically what we started with. So we started with our website where um, we kind of outlined, you know, like we kind of told our story, showed our garden, kind of outlined uh, basically this talk I'm giving right now in a written form. <laughs> um, and, and, and then we started to do that. And then we started, people started asking questions. And then I started uh, shooting YouTube videos. So I'd be out in the garden and I would run into a problem and I would just shoot a quick video. Like, here's what I saw, here's how I'm fixing it type thing, right? Just kind of, and then that just kind of kept going and picking up steam and, um, yeah, here, here's kind of an example of the type of YouTube videos we do. Kind of just me out in the garden showing what we do and whatnot. 
And then I started to talk more about some of the things that led to us building the guard. Because I, I started to talk a little bit about it and I started to notice people didn't necessarily think I was just crazy when I talked about anxiety. Before I always kind of held it in, but I felt like I, you know, I, I, I'd come from the place that I was before, which was, I don't, it's even hard for me to talk about where, how and where I used to be and even the person I was, because now it, it changed so much for me and I, I just had to share that message. So, so I started talking more about kind of how this had helped me and then that's kind of why I'm here today, you know, try, trying to share some of these messages. To, it's not just how to grow food, it's why you should care about it. Because growing your own food or it's just really just eating these foods, right? can change your life dramatically and it has for me. So we started doing more stuff like that. My, my son, Junior, was born, so we had to build, we had to build more gardens. Um, and then we did this. So, we, um, so I, I often think what my life would have been like you know, if I would have been introduced to plants at a younger age in a way that I would have been excited about. Because I was introduced to them, like in kindergarten, you plant the seeds, you know, and you did the whole thing. But, but it wasn't anything that grabbed my attention. It wasn't presented to me in a way that I thought was interesting at the time and I wanted to change that for future generations because I feel like a lot of the kids today spend a lot of time on devices and don't get me wrong like I, I I embrace technology I think it's a good thing but I think that you have to have a balance in life and I think that if we can get these kids exposed to that at an early age we can build these lifelong you know relationships with food and with with their garden that they, when, when they get stressed out they can have a place to go to so we did these kids festivals and this was out at Markham's nursery in Oklahoma City and we had them at three different Markham's and then at Prairie Wind Nursery. And we're gonna be doing a lot more this year too. So go sign up on our website if you'd like to know more about this. But basically what we do is we try and introduce gardening to kids in a way that they hopefully find fun. So here's the example of one of them. This is worm races. So we have a circle with two worms in the middle. The first, win, first one out wins. Um, we have educational games too. We have this game called Smell Like a Butterfly where we have a tomato plant or a marigold or something that we we're trying to hide around a bunch of herbs, right? And we have the child smell it, kind of memorize the smell, and we put it in the middle of a bunch of other plants, and they gotta find it with just their nose, blindfold. So it kind of shows them how insects find things. And, and this was kind of the goal, was to introduce kids you know, to this from that, from that angle. So, so anyway, we, we did those, and we, we had a lot of fun doing that. And then, so here, here's, here's kind of another thing we started to do with our garden. Um, I realized, you know, sometime along the way that although people liked the idea of gardening, the idea of going out, buying a bunch of wood, bringing it home, cutting it, you know, like putting it all together, like all this was, was kind of a big hurdle for a lot of people. And I had heard about these smart pots here a while back, but honestly I was very skeptical about them the first time I heard about them. They're fabric raised beds, they're made out of this felt like material, and the idea is that they're able to breathe through the side and they're able to do better. Well, I thought there's no way that thing is gonna survive our Oklahoma summers, right? So I started testing and I, I bought probably three or four and kind of put them out and started growing them side by side. What I found out was they actually outperformed my raised beds. Now let me clarify a couple things. I have to water them a little bit more. Um, so like if I have to water maybe Sunday and Thursday is my normal watering days, it might be Sunday and Wednesday with these. But I think it's worth it because these, are, these actually outperform my other ones. And I really believe the reason for that is this technology they talk about to where you know, the, the, the sides are breathable, so normally roots can only get oxygen from the top, whereas the plants are in these are able to come from the sides. So I, I think this is a great opportunity, and, and the thing I want to talk about is I think this is a great opportunity for anyone who wants to start growing food, because you don't have to go buy a bunch of materials and build anything, you just literally buy this, plop it on the ground, fill it with potting mix, and you're good to go. You don't have to till or do anything like that. Um, I have links to these all throughout the app as well, um, in, in our mobile app, and we're going to be releasing an update in the next few weeks that actually recommends the right size for each vegetable. So, um, so this is where I'm going to show, I want to talk about the mobile app and kind of talk about a little bit about um, the features in it and, and why we built them and how you can use them. So hopefully this little transfer thing I'm doing works. Is it working? Please work. Yay. Okay. So this is our app. And basically you can go through and you can choose whatever you want to grow. So I'm going to choose banana peppers. And the section at the top here gives you uh, dates to plant based on where you live. So it uses the, the nearest weather station. And there's weather stations scattered all throughout the United States. And all the data for them is accessible through the National uh, Oceanic Service. So anyway, I'm able to hook into that and calculate the exact dates that you can plant based on that information. 
So once you have your claim team, you scroll through and you can see, I have the most important information here at the top. You can see like starting method and things like that. As you keep scrolling, you can see more details about how to plant and what to do. We also do have links throughout the app. And these are things that I buy myself that I believe in. So everything in the app that we've linked to are things that I've either bought or that I do buy or things that, you know, the curated list of sorts. And I'll be completely upfront, we do get a small percentage of the purchases through this. That's why it's a free app. One of the reasons why it's a free app. But, um, so you can go through, you can see any blog posts that we have on our website about that vegetable at the bottom as well. And we're working on adding a lot more this year. That's one of our goals. So you can see here, you can tap on companions, and you can see which, what, which vegetables or herbs grow well with each one. And then you can tap on those to go into there to learn more. And then lastly, on this section, we have the pest tab. So you can tap on it, and you can see which pests attack each plant. And then you can tap on the pest to read about how to treat it. And we don't have any pesticides or herbicides or anything like that linked to in the app. We try and find natural ways to treat things. So for example, aphids are a nightmare to deal with in certain situations, but um, ladybugs love them. And you can actually order ladybugs on Amazon. So if you have an aphid infestation, oftentimes you don't even have to do this. You can just wait a few weeks and those ladybugs will show up. But if they don't, you can order them on Amazon, release them at dusk, they're gonna lay their babies and now you've got ladybugs to eat it. So you don't have to use any pesticide. And for most every pest, except for squash bugs, I'm still working on that one. If I can figure that out, I think I'll be able to retire. But um, with most every pest, there's some sort of natural predator or some sort of natural way that you can overcome that pest. So that's what we try and do is link to throughout the app. We have this tab here as well, this how to start tab, that basically walks through all the steps that we recommend to get started with gardening. So you know, step one, choosing the right location, um, how you can do that. Like there's a sunlight measurement tool, it's pretty cool to calculate sunlight that we link to. Um, basically all through we go through and throw that. And then on the pest tab, a picture of the larva and the adult for pretty much every pest that you can encounter around here in Oklahoma. So if you don't know what it's called, like I did the first year, I was constantly emailing Tracy, the horticulture uh, extension agent for Cleveland County saying, what is this bug and is it bad? And um, so basically you can go through and you can match it up and then tap on it to go and do from there. And we've got a lot of really cool stuff coming soon, like uh, helping you know when to water based on how much it's rained where you are, um, beneficial insects, things like that coming in too. So, um, yeah, I think this is probably a good point for me to stop and see if you guys have any questions or if there's anything that y'all want to know more about, maybe to dive into more details on, anything at all. We've got about 20 more minutes, so. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, so the question was the, the no, so these big bag beds, um, let me pull it up, and I've got it in the app here. So they do have a bottom that's the same material as the side. Um, so Bermuda cannot go through them. But roots can actually go down through them. And they're actually, so it's, you know, the ones that I've had sitting on top of soil for a while, when I go to pull them up, I'm actually pulling the roots up out of the ground too. So I do recommend putting cardboard and wood chips down and then putting it on top of it because you don't want to be mowing around it. And if you're weeding, I don't know how that weed is probably going to rip it up and stuff. So I wouldn't want to be messing with the Bermuda around it anyway. I think it's worth it to put the barrier, but you don't necessarily have to. And it also allows you to put them on a patio or on a wood deck or anything like that. They're really great to have around the kitchen, especially so you can have your herbs that you cook with around there. Yes, sir. What? All the cardboard. Oh, all the cardboard. Great question, great question. So when I first started, I went to like Dollar General and stores like that, and I got a lot of small boxes. They were like that big, right? And that's a pain because trying to lay those down, especially on a windy day, they're flying everywhere. You're trying to get wood chips on top of them before they fly away. And then I realized, I just need to get really big boxes. So I started thinking, where can I get big boxes? Like what sells big things, right? So my first, I have a store pretty close to me. It's the Harley Davidson motorcycle store. That was the first place I called and I said, you seem like you get big things in the mail. Can I have cardboard? And they said, yeah. So basically just try and think of uh, so don't call like, you know, Lowe's, Home Depot, they already have systems for handling their cardboard and they're, they don't want to, you call them and they're not going to listen. But if you call some like the Harley Davidson store, some sort of like smaller type of thing, you know, that isn't quite so corporate, I know it's corporate, but, but still, you know, um, then you're able to have better success. If you have anyone that works, you know, like, uh, in, like the cells, uh, think about like exercise equipment, this thing, you know, TV, anything like that. But I recommend, recommend doing that. And if you can, if you can, two layers of cardboard, does make a big difference. 
because the first year I only did one layer. I didn't even overlap it real well. I had cracks, and then I was fighting Bermuda in those areas, and I ended up having to put like three feet of wood chips on there. Um, so you can avoid yourself some future frustrations by covering it all out with two layers of cardboard, and then just one foot of wood chips should be good. Another source for wood chips too, uh, chipdrop.com is a website that connects people to landscapers that want to drop wood chips at your place. So I, I actually got a delivery a few months ago where they brought out a huge dump trailer full of wood chips and just dumped them on my front porch. So that's another option as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, I'll, I'll repeat that. So he, he, had, he had a good point too with the, the tree services, and like the landscaping companies directly, just go directly to them too. I haven't had much success with that so far, but I'm also not really like, aggressive about it. You know, I've called it maybe two or three times and didn't get, so like, uh, I actually, I mean, I, I just go down to the Norman Compass facility once a week. I kind of enjoy the trip down there and the time away from Screaming Kids and, uh, and all of that. So, um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great option too, is just directly with the landscaping company. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question was, if you're gonna put those away in the winter, what do you do with the dirt inside of them? So the cool thing about Oklahoma is you can grow things year round. So kale, you know, spinach, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes lettuce, you can just grow it through the winter. So I don't, I don't empty mine at all. I have stuff growing year round in them. Um, but yeah, you could, I mean, it, it's, it'd be a bit, trying to like fill those and unfill them would be a pain. I, I really don't recommend it. I would just leave them in there um, and then try. And then other things too, like there's perennial herbs, you know, chives are gonna last all winter and they're gonna do great. Uh, rosemary, sage, all those things will do well too. So there's plenty of things that you can grow through the winter. Now, on the spinach and kale and things like that, it's gonna stay alive through the winter, but it's not gonna grow a whole lot. So you're not gonna be harvesting it really during that time, but then come February, March, like right now, our spinach is exploding, the stuff that was planted last fall, because it already has its root system in place, and as soon as spring hits, it's ready to go. So you're not having to wait for a seeds to germinate and all that that you typically do whenever you start again. Yes, sir. What do you use in your rice beds for soil? Do you use some potting mix? Yeah, great question. The question was, what do we use in our raised bed for soil? So I, the Square Foot Gardening book has this recommended mix. It's called Nell's Mix. It's basically just potting mix. It's, one, it's, it's three equal parts of three different ingredients. Those ingredients are vermiculite, which is this white kind of, if you ever look at potting soil, the little white flakes that are in it, that's either vermiculite or perlite. And it's, it's a rock that's mined out of the ground heat it until it explodes. The purpose of that is it absorbs water really, really well. So it's just holding things for water. So that's one part of it. The next part is either peat moss or coconut core. You can go with either one. And that's more of just kind of a filler thing too. It's not providing nutrients at all for the plants. It's just kind of a good growing medium. And then the third part, which is the most important part out of, out of all of it, is compost. So for my compost, I like to get a variety of sources. So I get uh, Minic Materials has three different types of compost. I get each one of those. I go to Markham's and get some of their compost, and I mix all of it together in a one big batch. Um, and then I use that as a third ingredient. Now, I will tell you that Mel's mix is pretty expensive because vermiculite is about 30 to $40 a bag. You're gonna need one bag per, well, for, for, for one smart pot, you need about one bag to go the right way. So I've started backing down on the amount of vermiculite that I use. Um, and I've started supplementing with some other stuff that, that holds moisture as well. So things like pine bark, you know, holds moisture pretty well. Uh, perlite is a little cheaper than vermiculite, so I'm switching to that. Um, and also I've just cut back on the amount that I use. I mean, the more vermiculite you have, the better gardening experience you're gonna have because the more water retention, but I'm out in my garden every day anyway. And at the scale that we're doing, I just couldn't afford to keep doing the same amount of vermiculite. So I actually have on my website videos that show how we make our seed sardi mix because there's some ways you can do to make it easier. If you're trying to mix it on a tarp, that gets it's a pain. Um, have you seen those composting bins that tumble, that are like up in the air? Those are terrible for composting, but they're great for mixing soil. So I always buy them on Craigslist and then use them just because like the whole idea of composting in those is kind of silly to me because compost, like you're, do you're dealing with soil microorganisms. You, they need to be on the ground, you know? Um, it's, uh, so like, but I really like using those tumblers to make soil. So that's a, a little hack on how to do that easier. Yes, sir. What didn't work? 
What didn't work on my squash bugs? Nothing works on squash bugs is the problem. So here's the thing about squash bugs. They're basically cockroaches. They have an exoskeleton that is in, like, you can't get through it. So even if you wanted to use pesticide, it's not going to work on them. It'll work on the nymphs, like the babies before they develop that. Um, what works best on my squash bugs, and I know this isn't an option for everyone, but I pay my kids a quarter for every one they catch. And they're very good at it. Um, but the biggest thing you can do is prevention. So the thing you got going for us with squash bugs is their, their eggs don't hatch overnight. So if you go out there and you check the underside of your leaves, you know, every day, and you see those little patches of eggs, now you know you got at least one, it's time to get hunting. Which a way that you can hunt them, I spend a lot of time figuring out like how to hunt squash bugs, is you can just spray the plant with water and the squash bugs don't like that. And they'll start trying to get to high ground, right? So then they'll start moving around, then you can see them. So if, if, if you see those eggs, and first thing you gotta get rid of those eggs, which you can use tape, like double-sided tape to get them off, that's an easy way. But then you know you've got an adult around, you've gotta find it, so I just start spraying. And usually I can manage them pretty well that way until about July, and then I just give up on zucchini. Um, one thing I'm gonna do different this year is I'm gonna start uh, what's called a trap crop. So I'm gonna start some zucchini now in the same spot that I knew there were a bunch of squash bugs last year. I'm gonna do just one plant, and I'm gonna let it get decent size. The hope is that all the squash bugs are gonna to come to that one plant because it's the only plant of that family I'm gonna have out in the moment. And then once they're all there, I'm gonna chop the plant, throw it in a fire, and laugh maniacally. And hopefully that will, that will make a difference. But you know, I've heard a number of things about being able to use like soap to drown them out, things like that. Um, I don't use soap in the garden for the same reason I don't get on a ladder. If I can screw up, I, I generally will. Um, and with soap, you can very easily suffocate your plants and kill them if you use too much. Um, so I generally avoid things like that, just because like I said, if I can screw it up, I will. It's just, I'm genetically predisposed to do that. It's just, I, I just do. <laughs> Same reason why I'm good at finding bugs in software. I'm just, if, if I can break it, if it can be broken, I'll break it. Yeah, good question. So she's asking about anything you can plant mosquito repellent. I'll start off by saying the Centronella mosquito plant is not actually the mosquito plant that is a repellent. It's in the geranium family and isn't even the one that, uh, the biggest thing you can use for mosquito repellent is eucalyptus, not eucalyptus, I'm sorry. Which one is it? No, it wasn't lavender, it was lemon, lemongrass, yes. Lemongrass is a huge one. Another big thing you can use, there's a stuff called cedar side. It's made from, it's just cedar oil, is all that it is. And we use that as a base for our insect repellent. I think we have a blog on our website about how to make it actually, where you just buy the cedar side, cedar oil, use that as a base. And then there's a couple of different essential oils that work really well for repelling them too. And one of them was the lemongrass, and there was one other one too that we mix in as well. It's in the blog post, I know. But we mix that in, and then we just spray that directly on ourselves. Now, it works really well, but it doesn't last as long as the DEET stuff. Um, so you'll have to reapply it, you know, every couple hours, which we have four kids, so that's a pain, but it's better than spraying heat on them, in my opinion, so. And the, 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 there's actually really good stuff you can buy in the store now, too, so if you don't want to make it, they have, like, this eucalyptus, the lemon eucalyptus, it, it's in, they have stuff you can buy there, too, so. It's basically the same thing, just saving the money. Now, the stuff the store doesn't have the cedar oil in it, I've never seen that in the store. Um, and it works for ticks, too, so it's kind of a tick and mosquito oil, so. Yes. What was the question? Mm -hmm. Did they die at that point, or? Oh, with them, with them rooting in raised beds? Um, no, no, the, the, the problem I've had on tomatoes really is just, you know, trying to force the square foot gardening methods to work here. That's the biggest issue I've had. Here's the biggest things I've learned about tomatoes, and here's kind of my strategy for tomatoes this year. Up until now, I've grown indeterminate varieties. Those are varieties that vine and keep on going, keep on going until it freezes. So in perennial places, they just keep on going forever. Whereas determinate varieties are bush tomatoes, grow to like three or four feet, Romans are one, and they spit out all their tomatoes at once, maybe one more round after. I'm gonna stick to just those from here on out. Because those are really easy to manage. You just 
just put up like a little cage, you know, and then they'll stay within that cage. Um, I kind of like the idea of all my tomatoes coming at once because I, I just want to make salsa. I don't really eat a lot of fresh tomatoes as, as much. So, um, and there are other varieties that, that do kind of spit out with their kind of semi-determinants, but I'm going to stick to those. And if I do do any vining ones, it'll be like the cherry tomatoes because those do really well and the kids like them. But I think I'm done trying to grow these big vining tomatoes that uh, it's just, it's just a, it's a pain trying to manage on a trellis. Another thing too is that tomatoes um, will really benefit by having some protection from the wind and from the heat in the afternoon even. So you can build uh, wind breaks just by take, taking T-posts and you can get eight foot ones at tractor supply so you have taller coverage. And I put them on the east side of the bed. So I just put posts in the ground, posts in the ground, and then I take a shade cloth and then just attach it to those T-posts with zip ties. And that's on the east side of the bed. So then in the afternoon, it's shaded. You know, it shades out the tomatoes and they get a little bit of a break. And I try and, I'm sorry, the west side. Yes, I'm sorry. You're planting on the east side of it, you're putting it on the west side, sorry, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's something you, you can do too. And then the windbreak, is, is a, that makes a huge difference too. I mean, there's a reason why tomatoes from, from greenhouses grow so much better. It's not necessarily just the temperature, it's the lack of wind. Uh, and the protection from the wind. So all plants, uh, especially in Oklahoma, can get stressed pretty hard from the wind. So if you can do anything to protect them from that, it'll it'll definitely make a big difference. Oh no, 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 no. And one one thing you can do if you want to have more of, more of a root area with tomatoes, you can lay them down. And when you plant them, so you kind of like lay them down and then turn them up. So now you've got this whole area of, of roots that kind of you know develop along the way. Uh, the square foot gardening book says that you can grow in six inches of soil. I don't buy that in Oklahoma. I think technically you could if you're out there watering twice a day. But, you know, I think in order to have a manageable garden in Oklahoma, you can have a minimum of eight inches of soil. But I've got 20 inches of some of mine. I've started to, in those raised beds that are made out of wood, I've incorporated in the clay from below now to try and get some of those nutrients in and try and mix all that. So I've, so I've kind of got, but in the smart pots, obviously, those have a defined bottom. Any other questions? I think we have a little more time, or? Good. Well, yeah, we have time for a couple more questions, if anyone has any. I'll mention one more time, we're, we're on Facebook, and Twitter, and Instagram, and any other social media. I, I have one button that I press, and it goes to all of them, so I don't even keep track of where all, where all we are, but we're on all those, you can, you can find us on there, we do a lot of just random videos of either garden, it's either gonna be gardening related or it's gonna be something that injects love into the world. That's kinda, that's kinda the goal of what we do. We, we, it's kinda, you know, I, I felt frustrated around that time of the election too, thinking, looking at Facebook and just seeing all the negativity. And we wanted to create a place that was none of that. It was either learning about gardening or watching my two year old play in a race bed. So, so yeah, thank you for your time today. I, I appreciate it. And if you have any questions, we're gonna be, Outside, there's a blue building, right, or blue workshop, right between these two buildings, and we're there all all day today and tomorrow doing workshops where you get to uh, learn about how to cook with herbs and how to propagate them, and come ask any questions you want and come hang out with us. So, I'm literally staying in an RV here. I'll be here all weekend. So, come hang out with us. I don't have anything else to do. Thanks, everyone.